forward here. So welcome to Nebraska Nature Nerd Night, Parasites, Partying with Parasites. Partying with Parasites. I've been looking forward to this one. Yeah, I got a lot of questions already. Yeah, and we have, um, our experts joined us a little early and like we couldn't stop asking questions. And we, we had to, to save stop. it for the audience. Yeah, so yeah. we did our best for you audience to kind of stop the nerd happening already. Um, so we'll just get started. Let's, should we start with our? Yeah, absolutely. Our All journey? right. Okay, ready? Here we go. If you're a nature loving science nerd, we think that you just might be happy like us to start Nebraska Nature Nerd Night. Birds, bees, parasites, snakes, and fossils too. Your curious brainiac, we got a show for you. We always have to start off with so good. nerdy. I know, every but time. We have yes. to set the tone so people know what to expect. We're just I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we do have a show for you tonight, everybody. Um, we're going to talk about parasites tonight. And specifically, we have a couple of awesome guests who we'll introduce here in a second joining us from Lincoln today. Um, when we were kind of figuring out topics here, we kept asking, who's the parasite person? Who's the parasite person? And we asked maybe, what, five or six people? Mm -hmm. And everyone said... Dr. Scott Gardner. Mm -hmm. Everyone said this was the guy to talk about parasites. So that's what we're going to be talking about um, tonight. And we'll we'll introduce our guest here in a second. Um, I do have a couple of things that I want to show all of you, just some kind of housekeeping details here. Um, and then we will get started. Whoops. I'm going to share my screen here really quick with everybody. The same thing. Yes. All right. So um, if you've been to a Nebraska Nature Nerd Night before, thank you for coming back. If this is your first time, um, welcome. Thanks for joining us. So uh, this is a monthly kind of a segment thing that we are doing. It's always going to be virtual for now, um, although there are maybe some plans that going um, in person here sometime soon. Who knows? So uh, tonight, like I said, we're going to be partying with parasites. We're going to be diving into UNL's parasitology lab. And just so that everybody knows, we love it. If you ask questions, we'll get to them. Um, as soon as we can. And we do have our lightning round that we'll talk about here at the end. Um, if you do have questions though, and you put them in the chat function, great. Um, just please um, be kind to everyone and keep your uh, questions and your comments kind of topically relevant to what we're talking about tonight. Otherwise we might have to remove you, but I'm sure that we will not have a problem. Everyone's excited to talk about parasites tonight. And just so that everybody knows, like I said, we're going to be um, doing this for a while here. So all the way until November. So we got some really cool topics coming up. Like I said, tonight's parasites. We got some fossils. We have talking about mustelids coming up here. We have some stories from the field, venomous snakes for reptile month in October. So lots of cool things that we're going to talk about. Lots of nerdy yeah, things that we're going to be talking about. Nature nerdy, so. in fact. All right. And just so that everybody knows, um, this is kind of a more of a science cafe feel. So it'd be really informal. Um, we're going to be doing some jokes every yeah. once in a while. We have some good jokes. We so, apologize um, for that. Yeah. Uh, speaking of jokes, do, do you want to hear one, Amber? Please. I want to hear one. A parasite joke. Okay. okay. So a really bad, dangerous parasite walks into a bar. Bartender says, hey, we don't, we don't serve your kind here. Parasite says, well, you're not being a very good host. So... <laughs> Please laugh. I hope you laugh. So it's a horrible. Joke. It's, it's a dad joke. Yeah, it's what it is. Yes. <laughs> Um, so just let everybody know, um, this is what we got going on tonight. We're going to stop sharing our screen here because this is not the point. We're going to be talking to our experts, our, mm -hmm. our parasite experts. I think they want to probably hear from them now. I think so. All right. Let's go ahead and introduce So them. I'm going to introduce you. We are so excited to be, um, to be having our two experts join us from the lab. They kind of are dressed like they, they look like they're joining us from the field, which is great, but they're from the lab, the parasitology lab. And so tonight we have Dr. Scott Gardner. He's That's me. Perfect. There he is. He's a professor and a curator of parasitology at the University of Nebraska, the State Museum, and the School of Biological Sciences. And we're also joined by Dr. Gabor Rocks, and he's the collection manager. There he is. Hi, Gabor. Hi. Collection manager of the University of Nebraska's Mantor Laboratory of Parasitology. So we're going to learn more about that amazing collection tonight and just more about parasites in general. So um, experts, are you ready for our questions? We are. Yes. Awesome. Very good. Okay. Do we want to make this like a full screen? Do that. All right. So my first question, it's, it's a, it's kind of, it's kind of a fun one, but um, I just want to know from you, I want to hear from you both. You know, we're all nerds here tonight. I'm hoping at yeah. least. What turned what turned you both into parasite nerds? What what kind of got you hooked, so to mm. speak? What got you infected? That was a bad <laughs> joke. What infected initially, you with the love of the passion of parasites? What was the initial infection? Yeah, exactly. interesting yeah. question. 
Yeah. Well, I got, I got infected when I was about 12 because my uncle would come to our farm in Oregon and he would uh, look at the different rodents that we had living on our farm and he would open them up and he showed me how to do it. So I started doing it then when I was about 12 and this must have been 1968. Did you and so my first field infected? notes. I want to, I want to be clear. No, no, only, okay. only <laughs> mentally. Yeah. Okay. So um, okay. 1968, I started looking at things and um, after what, 10 years, then I published or maybe 12 more years, I published a paper on, on what I was doing there on our farm. So Wait, um, he was a world, world famous How person. Old were you? Go ahead. How old were you when you published that first paper? Well, I was, that when I was in, 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 at the University of, of uh, Oregon State University. Cool. Yeah, so, so I was probably, what, 25 or something like that, 27. And I'm just yeah. curious, was your uncle a parasitologist or was he just a curious dude? No, he was a parasitologist. He was one of the most, uh, world, most world famous parasitologists at the time. Wow. And he was in Alaska. And so he would come down for, for vacation, but it wasn't really a vacation. We just went around and looked at looked at different parasites. So, so what that's how we started. Parasitology is in your blood. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Hopefully I don't have any of those sure. now. But you know, have any now. now, yeah. I have a bunch of plasmodium right here. I can show you later. Oh, awesome. Which and, is the malaria parasite. So, and, and more. How did, yeah. Yeah. Before, um, yeah, I was... Uh, and, and I was interested in animals. My first exposure was when I would be 14, 15. Uh, I was collecting uh, small mammals, small rodents, and I got infected with a, oh, a yeah. virus. So he so, was really infected. Yeah, like, yeah, so I ended up in the hospital. So it's a virus. It's also a parasite. And uh, But I, I kept going, and I was, I, I was still interested in mammals, and I, I worked in different places. Um, I worked with hantaviruses in New Mexico, um, and um, the common ground is that we are both interested in uh, diseases, especially uh, diseases in mammals, so small okay. rodents. So that's the uh, connection between the two of us. Okay. And I ended up here because this is one of the, uh, the best place to do mammal research and in infectious diseases. The best place, would you say, like in... Like the well, it, it, well, in many places. I mean, there are other, but there is a virology center here mm -hmm. on, on campus that's really good. Uh, this is one of the largest uh, parasite collection. You can compare it in the world. So, um, in, in fact, I'm from Hungary. There is a really nice uh, parasite collection there. And um, there were connections that Scott knew some of the guys who worked in Hungary. Yeah, who example, he worked with. Yeah. Who I worked with yeah. before we met. So, yeah. so okay. um, who would have ever thought Nebraska? I know. What, I mean, of all places, I don't think Nebraska and Paris. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So that's awesome that we have this. I think brought me here is the the research and the university campus and the, the especially the research and the museum here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. It's it's so nice. We always like to ask our nerdy experts yeah. like where that passion began. So that's kind of cool to hear that. Um, that what that you were both infected by the passion and when you were literally infected, but yeah, you kept was, going and you were curious. So that's so awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah our, it's our, true. And then my first kind of like really question to dive into the subject of parasites is if I were to explain to like let's say an you know, eight year old or a yeah. ten year old or a kiddo, I just want to explain how would you define like, what is a parasite? How would you define that? The definition is what I tell my intro zo students is yeah, that the parasite. A parasite is something that uh, infects another animal, and uh, it's usually smaller than the other animal, so it's small, and it uses up some of the resources. It usually causes some kind of a problem. Um, so basically, like, yeah, so we would just say, you know, a little kid, uh, we tell a little kid, you know, parasites are something that can live in or on another animal. And uh, that's basically the, the real good definition that I like to use. In or on an animal. Yeah, or you know, it could be a parasite on a plant too, in or on a plant, because there's lots of things like aphids and mm -hmm. and spider mites on plants, and there's uh, nematodes that live on plant roots, and some nematodes live on the in the plants themselves. So there's huge numbers of parasites out there. So um, it's just really pervasive. So they're not always 
microscopic either. Like you could see them with the naked eye. Like for yeah, instance, like, I work with like snakes. This one you can see a, yeah, you can see a lot of mites on snakes. Okay, what do you time. what do you have there? This is Ascaris. This is uh, a, t a nematode called Ascaris, and this Ascaris. Um, I had one of these in me. <laughs> Pretty big. Is, is that yeah, the see? one? <laughs> No, the one that I had in me is in the museum on, on the fourth floor of Morrill Hall. So if you want to see that one, you have to go up there and check it out. Okay. I love that space. Yeah. I have to ask, did you, did, when you, you, know, you had it in you, was this something that happened incidentally or was this like a dare in the parasitology field that y'all just... Oh, no, I wouldn't want one of these. The life cycle of this one goes, um, if you eat, if you get an egg in you, it goes into your stomach, then it hatches and it penetrates your blood system. Then it goes through your blood and goes through your heart. Mm. Then it busts out of your heart and go. It goes goes through your pulmonary vein into the, into the pulmonary. I'm sorry. It goes to the pulmonary vein and into the uh, lungs, and then it breaks out of the lungs and crawls up your trachea, and then you swallow it down again. Then it grows that big. Okay. So you don't want to go in and eating people's poop who have this. Can I? Can where I, did you? How? How? how did what? You get well, it? I got it in Bolivia. I was in Bolivia, and uh, so the, is the food washing is not so good down there. So I probably got it in a restaurant, in a on a salad or something. Okay. Who knows? But I came back up here, and I I looked in my, I did a, a fecal sample and looked. I said, "There's an egg." Usually, I see eggs in samples from other animals, not just me. So I, I said, no, that's for me. So, looking, I, so I took it to my doctor and he said, no, we don't have those here. I said, well, here's the slide. He looked at it and he said, well, I guess we do. So he gave me one pill and uh, the next morning I stirred around the toilet with a chopstick and pulled out an nematode. And that's the one that's in the museum up in the lab, up in the, in the state museum. Thank but God looks, you're a parasitologist. <laughs> just looks, yeah, it was, it was like I had a baby. It was great. <laughs> okay. That was that's gonna set the tone for that. Night. Is I'm really welcome sure. to Nature Nerd Nine, everybody. Yeah. yeah, so it wasn't painful at all, though. So I, I, you know, I can't really say about having a baby, but you know, it was kind of like, you know. So we kind of have heard about like what parasites are. We've had some great stories about people <laughs> getting parasites. Yeah, why, that's one. Why would we study them? Like, why? Well, would we... oh, geez. Um, the reason we study them is because they're the most parasites are the most common form of life on earth everything every species has two or three parasites host specific so we have more species of parasites than than free living organisms because all the free or free living organisms have parasites two or three or four species some even more is wow. that how you i didn't i don't know if i've ever heard that dichotomy you could yes. you, could you organize all of of life or animals of Parasites and then free living organisms. Is that kind of the language? Yeah, that's how we interpret it up here. So the parasite, sense. we interpret parasites as anything that lives in and on another animal. So we work on most animal parasites here. Okay. And so what I mean by animals all the way from beetles. Yeah. Um, these are these are um, nematodes that live in beetles. Um, you can see them in there, right? Right there. Um, nematodes that live in beetles, and these are bark beetles. And so people are studying these to see how we can control bark beetles, for instance. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so these are nematodes and bark beetles, and those—that's how many slides we have of the nematodes that live in beetles. Just huge numbers of slides, yeah. and they're all all on those kinds of things like that. Wow. Yeah. So they're really—I mean, parasitism is extremely—it's just everywhere. It's probably you know, in in that kind of. That's a good transition to my next question, because we've heard this a lot, like when we talk about parasites in the biology world, you know, and, and you talk about it to the public, I hear people say, oh, they're disgusting, they're gross, or they're lazy, they're just kind of leeching off other uh, organisms. Yeah. So that, that word, that anthropomorphizing of they're lazy, but in my mind, it's like, that's just another life strategy, right? Yeah. It's just they're, they're they're smarter, 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 not smarter, or smarter, not harder. Right. So can you talk about, and you just said that's, I didn't realize that that's the most common life form yeah life form because so, everything has viruses too so can you okay so can you yeah can you comment on like can you talk about what that life strategy looks like and maybe speak to that like thought of oh they're just lazy can you speak to like well actually it's like it's working or you know yeah some people um kind of define parasitism as as uh, uh degenerate organisms that have gone from free living forms to something else but most of them haven't most of them have, have evolved as a parasitic form 
and uh, they evolved um, in a phylogenetic sense. You know, you can look at a phylogenetic tree, and they they some of them track their hosts and pair hosts as they as they're evolving, and others jump from host to host a lot. So there's a lot of hosting going on, and there's a lot of co-evolving going on. So there's different different kinds of parasitism. Some of them do a lot of staying with one group of hosts, like many kinds of parasites that live in fishes don't live in anything else except certain kinds of fishes like deep sea fishes or shallow water fishes or whatever. Mm -hmm. But other things like, um, like certain kinds of lice that live on, on mammals, they only occur like on pocket gophers, for instance. There's a whole group of, of, of lice that only occurs on pocket gophers. They don't occur on anything else. Mm -hmm. And so, but then we find sometimes the parasites do switch into a different host group. So there's all kinds of different yeah, what happens? Like, that. that makes me think. I'm just going here because I'm getting super yeah, curious. Yeah. That makes me think. What happens when? Now I'm thinking about prehistoric parasites, and I'm thinking of like parasites of dinosaurs, or prehistoric mammals. What happens when those groups of animals go extinct? Do those yeah. parasites go extinct, or do they switch hosts? Is, is there any well, knowledge? Of what has happened? There was probably that? a lot of there was probably a lot of extinction when there when the dinosaurs um, exited the world. Um, but of course, all the dinosaurs didn't go extinct because we have birds, mm -hmm. right? True. So birds are just simply flying dinosaurs. And so all the birds have huge diversity of parasites. Um, one of the things that's so interesting is, is, yes. So one of the things that's interesting is that the, the um, sharks and, and rays were around during the dinosaurs and they never went mm -hmm. extinct. And so if you look at the parasites of tape, tapeworms, for instance, in sharks and rays, there's, they're hugely diverse. There's hundreds and hundreds of species of different parasites in the different species of sharks and rays because the, the sharks and rays never under, underwent a, an extinction. They, uh, they um, maintained fairly high, high number of species all through the uh, tertiary boundary when, when, the, when the mammals first took off and the, all the dinosaurs went extinct. Well, not all, but you know, the birds are still here. So yeah, it's 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 massive. I mean, if you get into parasitism, you think about parasites. It's uh, it's basically when I teach my intro zoo class, it's almost like intro parasitology. If you if you remember, I do so. remember this about ten years ago. I had you. As yeah, well. yeah. So, yeah. Probably should do, go back and look at your notes. So uh, it, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna show you uh, the diversity of parasites in this place. We're gonna show you right now the cases of parasites that we have here. So let's show number one. So this is parasite slide number one from our case up on the top. Yeah. The very so, first one. The very first one. This, this is the very first one that was collected in your lab or the very first one that you guys personally collected? Well, this, no, this is when this parasitology um, was started in 1971. This was the first specimen that was put into the collection, number okay. one. And this was collected by uh, Dr. Manter, and this is the Manter Laboratory of Parasitology. It was collected by Dr. Manter from the Galapagos Islands, from Charles Island, uh, Galapagos, and it was and it's called Lobatostoma pacifica, and it's from Trechinotus, which is a, a fish. Um, Paloma is the the fish, and it's a, it's a little trematode. So. That's number one in the collection. And so then all of these boxes are all the way full of, of tapeworms, nematodes, trematodes, and everything else. And, um, and so all these boxes that we see here and all these cases all the way down here are all the way full of these. And you can see even more here. Wow. So about and how many did you say you have? How many specimens do you have? Uh, we have, well, right now we're at um, slide 183,201. Wow. And do you so, have like a, a Dewey Decimal parasit parasitic kind of like organization or how do you, you just number them and then you log them? How does that, I know. Yeah, we, know, we number them and we log history. them and we put a, we put a barcode on each one. Do we have an example barcode? Yeah. yeah. So we have a bunch of fleas here. Um, uh, a, a researcher recently donated his whole collection of fleas to us. How generous of him. Yes, it was amazingly generous. Can you imagine all of your life's work of flea collecting and then we have it all of this guy. I wish so, I could. So if you scan that, then you would be able to access our database mm -hmm. and you can see um, our QR code. And there's mm -hmm. the, can you flip it around to show the flea? 
Yeah, it's the flea so that, is in the middle. There's the flea. And this is, oh, this is a good one. This is from Sinomies. Do you know what, you remember what Sinomies is? Uh, like... Prairie dog. That's oh, it. You should know that. Yeah. Prairie dog That's should have known that one. Yeah. Anyway, so we'll have a, we're going to have an exam. Oops. Oh, yeah. We're going to have an oh, exam in 20 minutes here. I'm gone. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. Where did I, um, where did I go? So uh, here's a question for you. Um, are all parasites really bad for the host? You know, are there any, this is a, this might be a silly question, but are there any like good parasites? Is there any benefit at all? Is it always kind of like I'm taking the resource? Is it always bad? Is it always detrimental? Can you speak to that? Um, your video oh. Be? oh, there we go. Yeah. So parasites, uh, the definition of parasit parasitism is that the parasite does harm. Mm -hmm. That is the definition. The definition of parasitism is That's it does harm to the host. Okay. So that's really, uh, you're, that's, you know, you're probably kind of right on there. Um, so we have, that's just one example of all the different kinds of parasites that we have there, but we have other things here in this, this cabinet. And this is kind of our, our show and tell cabinet. So you can see tapeworms and we can see blobs and blips and all kinds of weird things. We see nematodes in these jars. And we see cysts of different things. There's a giant cyst of Echinococcus granulosus from a sheep. So all yeah. kinds of things. So some of the par some parasites are really bad. Like we're working on a, a tapeworm now called Echinococcus multicularis that lives in uh, what lives in, it lives in um, foxes in North America, and it also uh, lives in rodents. So it goes. Fox, rodent, fox, rodent. Because huh. um, it lives in the rodent and it, it lives in the tissues and then the fox eats the, eats the rodent and gets those tissues into its intestine. And then the tapeworms then reproduce in there and they produce eggs. They go out and then the rodent eats the eggs and becomes infected. So um, so I saw a question come in there. What was that question? Yeah, this is, we got some good ones. We have two. Um, okay, so our Araceli asked, what kind of parasites lived when the dinosaurs did? That's such a good question because that makes me think, do we have parasite fossils? Like, is there any, would there be evidence of prehistoric parasites? You know, how would you know that? Well, um, there were all the parasites that we know now were living in the dinosaurs probably also, because if we look at birds, they have nematodes and they have, they have tapeworms and they have trematodes and they have, they have lice and they have mites and they have all kinds of things. So, Probably everything that we would have found in a dinosaur, you would find in birds now. Mm -hmm. um, we published a paper um, about 10 years ago where we described a species of pinworm, which is a little tiny nematode that occurred in a, what's called a cynodont, which is the precursor of the um, warm blooded mammals that gave mm -hmm. rise to all the rest of the mammals, 250 million years old. And so we found the, the, the tiny um, egg of a oxyurid uh, parasite of a, of, a, of a nematode in, an, in a coprolite, which is a, a fossil poop from a cynodont, which is a precursor type of mammal that gave rise to the, to the mammals. So you do so have parasites in coprolites, like you found. Right, so we can find parasites in coprolites, so that we've actually it's found a pinworm egg in one. there's like a song or a poem there, parasites and coprolites. Yeah, you could start. Next time you guys can like strum up your ukulele to that. Yeah. Good idea. Yeah. We'll have to do a jingle on that. Okay. <laughs> we have uh, really cool uh, ways to see parasites here. And this is one of my favorite things. This is our dice microscope. Mm -hmm. It's a, a scope microscope that was donated to us by uh, Zeiss Corporation. And uh, we uh, have been able to keep it going for several years. And it's just an amazing, uh, piece of equipment. It's it's just really beautiful. So here is a specimen that's on the microscope, and you can see um, you can see that there's probably two things there. You can see one if yeah, if you could hold out. hold that, and then I'll point. So here you can see the anterior end of this oh, no, animal no, here, and then it, again. Uh oh, it went away. Oh, okay. Just a second. We'll get you back. There we go. 
So this thing, this is the anterior end of this, um, it's called the schistosoma mansoni. This is, in fact, this species of parasite infects about, oh, 200 million people in the world right now. And so this right is now. the anterior end, and uh, then it goes around this way. And this is the female that lies in this gynecophoral canal of the male. So this is the male, and this is the female lying in this canal. And so they stay in permanent copulation the rest of their whole lives in the bloodstream of their host. What? Whoa. Okay, there has okay, so, back up. There has to be a scientific term for, for permanent, permanent copulation. copulation. There has to be, and that's another we song. It, that's yeah. another song. That's a poem. Why are we? Yeah, not? you can. I'm sure you guys can look that one up. You don't so, know. Um, so this is called the gynecophoral canal that the male has, and the female lies in that canal, and they stay in copula for their okay. their whole life. They're and they live twenty years in your in your blood vessels around your chest. Ethan, you're laughing. I see this. Do you know the word for population? I don't know off the top of my head, but is I, there a word? There must be a good one for it because I also think you know, like male anglerfish also are kind Ooh. of in the same same. Okay, okay. okay. I we, we need to find this out. Okay, that's that's so, fascinating. Yeah. So talking about like these different animals that get parasites, like birds, reptiles, mammals, dinosaurs, everything. Can a parasite? Yeah contract or get infected with a parasite? What a question. Can a parasite well, be a parasite in a spirit That's one of the things that we're interested in looking at is uh, what kind of viruses are in parasites. So um, we're, we're starting to look at that, but it hasn't really been investigated very much. Okay, you are on the cutting edge with your I, curiosity. Yeah. I should just- but there, it, is a, there is a venereal nematode, a virial parasite of nematodes, if you'd like to hear about it. Wait, can I ask a question? I've heard you mention this a few times and I want to ask a clarifying question because I'm really interested. I've heard you mention virus. And I want to ask, is virus. do you consider a virus a parasite then under your definition? Or are they two totally different things? Well, it's not a not a classical uh, defined parasite. Uh, viruses are no, no, usually thought of as parasites in general because this is a parasitology lab. We mostly work on metazoan parasites, things that are like animals. Okay. But um, viruses are kind of classical parasites. They cannot live without their host cells. They can't so they're pretty, pretty, uh, pretty good definition of parasite too. Well, like Mozart, classical parasite. Okay. But there's even venereal. Uh, there's one parasite that lives inside nematodes, and it's called a, it's a venereal parasite, venereal disease of par of of nematodes. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see if I can remember. It, it lives in heterachus. Heterachus is the nematode that lives in chickens, and um, the, uh, it causes the, the protozoan parasite that lives in the chicken um, can get into the, uh, the reproductive tract of the nematode, and then it gets into the eggs of the nematode. And then when the eggs of the nematode are produced, they go out of the chicken in the feces, they go into the soil, and then they can sit in the soil for 10 years. So the parasite can be in the soil 10 years in the nematode egg, and um, the nematode can then be eaten by an earthworm, and then the chicken eats the earthworm, and then the, the parasite can Mark, break like out a, again. It's in like a the, Russian doll in situation. It just keeps going right? and going and going. Like, going. Yeah. That's just like a Russian doll. So that's a, that's a good example of a parasite in a parasite that gets up in the uterus of the, of the nematode. Sounds like yeah. a fun time to me. So, so that's all cool. of this sounds kind of, yeah. you know, not scary. Like, it's, it's super interesting. But like, I don't know, I usually think of parasites like in tropical areas. And I obviously know we have some in Nebraska. Do we have to be worried about anything here? Yeah, so what do, what do parasites look like in Nebraska? The ecology of like parasites in Nebraska. Well, what we is, have these, we have things like this in Nebraska, these oh, things, this is so many things, but they occur in mostly birds and uh, some mammals like scraps. Um, but it's the same schistosoma, it's called, it's called schistosomatheum dalthati. But um, you probably have heard of swimmer's itch. Swimmer's ear, Maybe but not it. No. Yeah, so if you swimmer's itch, um, that's bad because what happens is swimmer's itch is um, caused by uh, trematode larvae that have just exploded out of snails and they're sitting in the water column waiting for a duck or other, uh, uh, other host to come by. And then a human comes by and they penetrate your skin. And every time, they, every place that they penetrate, you get a, a real big pustule and it's really itchy and it's really bad. So it's called swimmer's itch. And it's really common in the warmer lakes here in Nebraska. In Nebraska. Um, and it's at the surface in Nebraska. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so I've had I've had several people call us. What's that? 
Is this a seasonal thing or is it like a anytime you could go in the lake, you could get this? Pretty much seasonal in the summer because the snails, uh, we could go into uh, a long, we could go into many lo long lectures of life cycles of parasites and snails and hosts, but basically the snails are the immediate hosts, the ducks are the definitive host. The, the eggs come out in the in the water, the snail becomes infected, the snail, then they multiply in the snail, they bust out of the snail, they swim up to the surface of the water, a little kid goes swimming and his body's covered with pustules the next day, and um, then that can be a big problem. Okay, that, that it's is- It's called swimmer's itch, and it's caused so my trematode larvae. What do you do to, after that? Do you go to the doctor and they give you, like you said, one pill and it goes away, or what do you do to get rid of it? No, the-, the these just go in the skin and then they die. That's why you get a big a pustule in the skin because it okay. becomes all itchy and stuff. Because they, they don't make it. Yeah, it's right. <laughs> but sometimes if you're immunocompromised, you can have even uh, your problems. Because, uh, your immuno, immu immune system just doesn't work well. So have, for instance, have you noticed, um, okay, two questions are coming to mind like right away. As a parasitologist, I feel like you probably have a different worldview you know, like if you go to a restaurant, if you go to a fish market, like if you go to different things. So like, do you have, like, what would like, if you know, have you ever seen those adorable Hallmark cards, like advice from a biologist or whatever, what would like, a, what would like a worldview or advice from a parasitologist be? Like, how should we live our lives? Not in fear, but what do, what are things that you do that maybe you do differently because you're a parasitologist? I don't know if you, maybe it's, I wash my hands a lot. Okay, you wash your hands a lot. So that's your basic thing. Wash hands a lot. And then if I'm going to eat sushi, I look at it really carefully to see if there's nematodes in there wiggling around. Oh my God. I love sushi. Can you? Oh, well, yeah, I so, love sushi. So can you? Yeah. What, what should I do? You should have it to make. First of all, make sure you have an ex sushi chef because they always check for parasites. The second thing is uh, if you like sashimi, which is, um, mm -hmm. or, or, or even uh, ceviche. If you like ceviche, which is fish uh, marinated in uh, like a vinegar um, and uh, yogurt type sauce. One time I went to a party when I was a graduate student and my good friend um, had, pre had prepared a ceviche dish from raw fish. And I looked in the dish and all these nematodes were crawling around on the top of the fish. Were you and just so I showed everybody at the party. And she, did, she didn't really like me very much. Are you probably not the popular the People asking about sushi, I think it's uh, in, in the US, it's mandatory to freeze uh, the fish before they are making yeah, sushi. Yeah, if, if you freeze the fish first, it kills the nematodes. But uh, some places they don't freeze it and you can you can become um, infected. infected. And it's really cool because the nematodes are called Terranova or Pseudo Terranova or Anasacus, and they penetrate right in your stomach and stick in your stomach and then to pull them to get rid of them, they go down your 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 esophagus with a with a video camera and one of those little grab light, grab things with the video mm -hmm. camera on it, the and end they the pick off the nematodes, pull them off, and then take pull them out and throw them away. It sounds like a fun. Time. So that's pretty cool. They have that's really common in Japan that that method of of uh, nematode removal. Because okay, that's huh? the difference in Japan. They don't have to freeze it. Yeah. So let's I, show you a few more things that we have here. Yeah. Let's go back to the vial. We're going to show you where that we keep the vials. Hopefully we are not dropping the connection. Okay. Man, we're getting some fantastic questions from the audience too. And um, as we're following him, audience, remember, I'm. we will definitely uh, ask, ask all these questions. If we don't get to him during the conversation, we're going to do it during our last five minutes or lightning round. So we'll, we'll for sure get these questions answered. You guys are really thinking tonight. I appreciate it. I have a lot of nerds tonight. I know lots of nerds tonight. This is, this is my crowd. This is cool. Uh-huh. Because apparently my, my family doesn't really like me bringing up parasites for Virginia. I mean, I'd be okay with that. We, I, we could eat I know. We should, yeah. Just not spaghetti. Yeah, not How spaghetti. <laughs> not fishy in Japan. All of these are all the way full of vials of parasites. Wow. So every one of these has has parasites in it. Or this is the stomach of something I don't know what. Did you say <laughs> vial or a vial? Here's a, here's a bunch of nematodes from a, from the, what's it from? Corolia, this is, these nematodes are from a bat from Bolivia. Oh, thanks. Yeah, he said bio. That's a sure. Okay. Um, those are filaria nematodes, and these are little pins from a, from, these are pins from a somewhere still from Bolivia. Mm -hmm. 
choose to see. But all of these are all like full. We have literally hundreds of thousands, millions of parasites in this lab. I thought those were normal. I know not, it's not full of not bio, boring bio. papers. So all these, all these are all like full of these are probably teams. <laughs> oh, I love your question. And we're getting some good. So there's an example of QR code on our okay. on our specimen. So we scan that with our, our reader and it tells what it is. Wow. Because obviously there obviously you guys had to collect these, like people, scientists had to collect all these specimens. So we do have some questions about what that looks like. So I know that both you and Gabor have done some field research. You've been out there in the field. What tell us about like maybe a day in the field, first of all. Like what, how do you collect a parasite? What, you know, what's your step? And second of all, maybe do you wanna share like some, like the, I don't know, like one of the craziest or coolest days you've had out in the field or the most surprising thing you've seen or where you've been? If you guys wanna- Oh my God. Well, we've been all over the place. We've been, um, I started working in, in parasites of mammals when I was working in Oregon in mm -hmm. 1968. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Alaska to work with my uncle. And then I went back to Oregon. Then I went to, to Colorado. Then I went to New Mexico. Then I went to Bolivia. And then we went to Mongolia. And then I went to South Africa. Then we um, have worked in, of course, even in Nebraska. So we've been working basically all over the place, Costa Rica and uh, Colombia. And we've been in uh, Mexico. And those are, those are most of the places we've gone to actually do work with parasites. Some of the most interesting uh, parasites that we found um, when we were working in, in Mongolia, we found uh, a parasite that's called Echinococcus multilocularis that lives in, in uh, small mammals okay. there. It's like a cocktail, I'm not gonna lie. And uh, so Echinococcus then voles, and so we fit like in the very last year of our work there and one of the very last collection localities that we had worked. And so it was really important because it's a really bad human pathogen. It's about 97% um, fatal if you get it and you don't get treated. See, but there's a 3% time rate. Yeah. So anyway, we found that there. So we published a paper on it and we told the people there that they need to be careful. It's one that gets in foxes. That's the one that goes in wolves or foxes and, and voles, wolves and foxes and voles. It's the same species or at least the same group of species that occur here in Nebraska. So huh. we don't have any people becoming infected here in Nebraska, but in Mongolia, a lot of people are infected because they live in close association with their dogs. Mm -hmm. And they, they, a lot of people have dogs who live out in the countryside and the dogs are play with the kids and the kids become infected when they're little. And by the time they're 30 years old, it's too late. They have a huge cyst in their liver. Oh, wow. So, they so, have anyway, oh, wow. so when we're in the field, we go out in the field, we basically, we go with, um, with mammalogists or ornithologists okay. or herpetologists or all, all of them. So just like parasites, you have to work like with a host, <laughs> like you have to work. Yes. With right, so we have to know um, all these different animals at the same time. So I work on mammal published uh, papers on new species of mammals and mammal uh, systematics and mammal uh, structure. So I work on mammals and parasites. Most people only work on one small group, but I do more. Um, and so Gabor works on viruses and mammals. And so we have a lot of, of, of synergistic activities where we work with different yeah. mammalogists, different people who are mammalogists, different people who are ornithologists. And we do this work simultaneously in the field and then we come back. So what we do is we go out, we go out and um, the ornithologists um, have collection permits and they use shotguns and they collect birds. And then we every single specimen is made into a, a Every specimen that's collected is made into a museum specimen. And every single specimen goes into a museum so it can be recorded where it was collected, when it was collected, who collected it, what kind of parasites were in it. Uh, the tissues also get saved, the heart, liver, kidney, and other uh, and gastrointestinal tissues get saved in, in uh, freezers. And those specimens are then used later. And so while those, that's happening, that while the person's working on the mammals or birds, then the parasitologists are working on the parasites from the mammals or birds that are collected to find out what kind of parasites are there. So the, this is a really big project whenever we yeah. do this kind of work. Wow. It sounds like it takes a lot of coordination. And just, just like science, it's like it's, it's a coordination. It's huge. A lot of yeah, and so our goal for all this is, is to study biodiversity and species exploration and species discovery. So the, our real goal is species discovery. Okay. 
okay. So what we're doing here in this lab is discovering new species and describing them before they're gone because they're going really fast. We're losing, we're losing parasites, we're losing mammals, we're losing birds very, very quickly all across the earth um, at every single minute we wait. So that's your goal, that's what drives you both. That's what drives us to do our work, is to do species discovery. Species discovery. Yeah. What, um, what's like, and, and I like that you just said that, and I wanna know what's one thing that you want people to know? Like if you could if you could have your grandstand and you could get people to, to be excited about it, what's one people you really want people, what's one thing you really want people to know about parasites? And why should your everyday person, why should they care about parasites? Well, what we I work on parasites that are not always just pathogens. We're kind that are, are normal part of the font of, of the world, of, of the animal, the birds, the fishes that are out there. Mm -hmm. And so the thing to know about them is that everything has parasites. Every species of host or every species of mammal, every species of fish, every species of bird has different kinds of parasites. And in order for us to really understand the mammals, birds, or fish, or amphibians, we have to know what's living in them and on them because if we don't understand that, we don't really know what's happening with the ecology and which, with the life cycles of these animals themselves. Oh. I saw, I keep seeing some uh, questions coming yeah. by on the bottom of my screen, but they come so fast, I can't read them. I know, um, I think we're at a spot, like we're gonna, gonna have so many good questions yeah. that I definitely do wanna We're gonna start our lightning round Yeah, now. let's do it. So we've had fantastic. If you're okay. familiar with the lightning round or if you're not, Basically, what we're doing is just answering, asking questions and getting really kind of fast answers because we want to get through all of them. Sure. So, um, are, you, are, you, are you ready? I'm, we're ready. Gabor and I will work together. Okay. So can you tell us about, oh, Sue Gardner, um, you're going to make me pronounce this in front of everyone, Spirochetti? 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 How do you spell it? Um, S-P-I-O-R. Oh, oh, okay. S P I O R C H E C E S. Spirochetes. Thank yeah. you. Spirochetes. Oh. I was right. So oh. the question is, what about spiro? What's the question yeah, about just, spirochetes? Just tell us really, and this is lightning round. So, um, tell us about spirochetes if you can. Spirochetosis. Like, about parakeets. I'm assuming it's not a bird. Yeah, spirochetosis are uh, spirochetes are little uh, bact or bacteria that are really large bacteria, and they're helical in shape, and when they move. Um, you can see them wiggling and they kind of coil as they move along through on your microscope. And uh, most wild animals have those and many, many dogs have them. It's called, it's called spirochetosis. And when people get it, it can be really bad because um, the people and many, many people get it who are guys who work on fire hydrants because people who work on fire hydrants get exposed to dog pee. And those oh, people who are working yeah, on yeah. fire hydrants who are exposed to dog pee can become infected with spirochetes, and so it's a pretty it's a pretty big problem. I know it's a problem in Europe too. Wow, yeah, but well, you can get a vaccine for that. Okay, huh. interesting. Get your vaccine. Okay, yeah. what um, we ask this one? Let's go to this one. You want to ask this? Um, um, wait, go down a little bit. Okay, right. Ethan had a fantastic one. You want to ask it? Yeah, so Ethan asked, how can studying the natural history of parasites on a geological or evolutionary time scale help us solve problems that face us today? That's a really good question. Right. Yeah, that's a deep, that's a deep question. The, the uh, way we can answer that is to understand um, how parasites diversified in the past. Mm -hmm. um, basically, we use the law of formatarianism that was developed by Charles Lyell and 1800s. Remember him? He was the guy who came with the idea that uh, that geology had uh, a common method or a common geology, geological processes that worked millions and millions of years ago are still working now. So it's called mm -hmm. the law of uniformitarianism. Basically, the law of uniformitarianism can, can apply all the way through into biology also, because if we look at phylogenetic relationships of parasites and hosts, we can see the, the diversification happens mostly when uh, parasites and hosts uh, are stressed, when there's stress things happening, especially like when um, all of the glaciers moved south, mm -hmm. there was a lot of host parasite switching. Mm -hmm. Or when the, when the uh, earth heats up, there's a lot of parasite switching. So if we look at what happened in the past, we might be able to predict what's happening in the future. And so the idea is for us to develop, I, develop phylogenies and evolutionary uh, scenarios 
based on fact and evidence of uh, host and parasite evolution, coevolution, and host switching to predict what might be happening in the future. Wow, I, I think I, I understand that. Yeah, now. that's really cool. That's fascinating. Yeah, so that's lightning. That's a lightning. Yeah, answer. that's a lightning. That was a deep question. Yeah, like I, from your answer, I have fifty more. Um, yes. And earlier, um, before we let everyone in, he joked. He said, "We have five hours tonight," and and now I'm seeing like right. I we did have. Five yeah, hours. we could easily. You know, we could easily I know. go. Because whenever I would give a lecture in my Bio 112 class, I ran out of time in 50 minutes, and it seemed like I was only speaking for five minutes. I'm sure. Like, yeah. This yeah. Is All right. Our next question. Are there organisms that are free of parasites? Please tell me my dogs right now are free of parasites, for example. But anyways, carry on. That's a good question. I was just thinking about like I've that. never, well, maybe our mediums do not have parasites but they're organisms they're not oh wait what, what was that you cut out a little bit yeah there are viruses that live in parasium so um i don't know of anything that doesn't have a parasite i mean you might look at no i do you know of anything <laughs> not a lot. Well, actually that's really difficult in labs so it's a big challenge that you have parasite free uh lab mice yeah you can't even get parasite free lab mice because the the uh, pinworm yeah, pinworms pin and viruses worms. are so easily transmittable yeah. so almost all dogs and cats and and kids get some kind of parasite during their life sorry did you say kids as in toddlers as in four-year-olds like, uh, like you know when we're we usually get pinworm when we're little or lice or yeah. lice lice are really common um, we have a lot of lice up here uh, mm -hmm. from kids. Um, ticks are really common, of course. Ticks are parasites. Mm -hmm. um, and right now it's tick season. So whenever you go out walking around the woods, you have to come back and check for ticks. So really common. But, um, really quick, on like a, like a general person that you would meet off the street, if you would test them for parasites, on average, like how many parasites would they have at one point? She's asking her. This is, I'm sorry. I'm Do I have a parasite right now? I'm cutting in line. That's what we're just wondering. Okay. Um, That's what we're, we're pretty clean here in the United States. Most people who live in our normal um, clean enclaves of a home with a bathroom and a shower, usually we don't have too many. But people who are living out, like the people in, in living homeless people, Mm -hmm. Homeless people have a really big problem with parasites. They have problems with lice. They have problems with other kinds of parasites now. So it's because they can't keep us clean, you know. So that's one of the things that we need to do in this in the United water. States is, yeah. is solve this homeless problem as soon as we can because it's going to be even worse as time goes on. Huh. Um, people who, um, but there are some par some places like India has really high parasite parasite rates because people are living in such close proximity and many people um, can't be vet that clean. Um, places in Africa where people who can't be clean. Um, Mexico has big problems with parasitism, especially um, places where they don't uh, keep their meat uh, really well monitored and you can get tapeworms from eating raw meat, um, uh, pig meat or cow meat. There's all kinds of things that you can do to decrease parasitism, but it takes a lot of money. It takes a lot, a lot of work uh, by, the, by people and by um, dedicated people who work on uh, making sure that they're uh, inspecting meat facilities to make sure we have clean food yeah hey remember when we went to africa and you ate the goat, goat eyeball do you I, think you had a parasite i, I mean, got sick i did get sick but i just like when in namibia i just I, ate the goat eyeball yeah okay. yeah i probably got a parasite probably got something there right? now so yeah they have okay. namibia has some um, I think Namibia doesn't have that many things if you're out in the countryside just uh, camping. So because you can keep uh, away from lots of people, but you know if you're in an area and you're not eating clean food, um, you can get like the nematodes that I got down in Bolivia, for instance. That's a scare. It's called Ascaris lumbricoides. It's very common. Um, well, yeah. it's so common that that nematode occurs in over one billion people right now. One billion. Wow. A billion in one billion people, even more than a billion people right now in the world. We have really fantastic questions from the, I, I'm so sorry if I mispronounce it, the Jemimus family tonight. And I have to say, we haven't had a lot of kiddos join our Na Nebraska Nature Night. Not too many, no. But tonight we do, and we have some amazing questions. So I just want to do a shout out of staying curious and I, I love it. So I'm going to ask, they have two questions really quick. One, do clams have parasites? And two, what kind of ticks can you find on an ostrich? These are fantastic. What kind of ticks do you find where? 
on an ostrich? <laughs> and do clams have parasites? I don't know about ticks on ostriches. Ostriches are from Africa originally. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned that if you were to look at ostriches living in Africa, you might find a couple of species that occur on oh, them. Ticks, yeah. yeah, but I don't know um, much about ostrich uh, ticks. Uh, yeah, and it, 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 actually some, here in the United States. Some the experts, way to go. You'll have to yeah, research that now. States, there are, um, depending on the location, the ticks are controlled by climate here in the mm -hmm. United yeah, States. So, so as you go from the East Coast, there is the dock tick. And you move south, south, move from the south to the north. Your, yeah, move to the um, um, to the west and to the drier areas. There, it's it's the um, deer tick. Or the dermacenter. Dermacenter yeah. and other ticks. So it, depending on where you are, and uh, ticks are not really picky. They will get into reptiles. Yeah. Uh, so ticks birds. ticks are, have low host specificity, really. So um, it's true. Yeah. So that, what was the other thing? Well, that makes me think what you just said, ticks and then climate. I was thinking about this and we, you know, we talk about climate change and I want to know, um, is anything going to, do you feel like as, as we look at the, the consequences of climate change, is anything going to change the range of parasites? For example, I just saw an article that Chagas disease from the parasite, what's that parasite, like trypanosis or something? Trypanosoma, it's trypanosoma cruzi. Yeah, so they, they found that in Nebraska recently, not to scare anyone, it's really interesting to me. So, you know, yeah, so it, do you see that like, you know, looking at the future or kind of like what Ethan's question is, do you see like at the future, like ranges of parasites changing? Yeah, it's it's just normal how norm, things normally behave when we have climate change and we have distributions of mammals and birds and other things moving north or south. Mm -hmm. uh, the parasites are gonna be changing also because some of them have specific requirements. And I saw the little blurb came by from Sue Gardner and it said, Hyaloma lives on uh, ostriches. So she looked it up and gave us the answer. That's this is great. no relation to you, right? Gardner and yes. Gardner? Yes. She's my wife. Okay, I wondered, wondered. <laughs> She's a librarian. She's a librarian. So you could, you could ask her how fast an ostrich runs and she would be able to tell you instantly. I got, I got the craziest question for you. So I have, a, I have a confession to make. Before we did this tonight, I joined, I was looking for a parasite Facebook group because I wanted to share, like we're doing this fun event. And I saw this cool like parasitology Facebook group, like this national one. I'm like, oh, this is gonna be a good one. These are the nerdy parasite people. Join, right. everyone's talking about eating parasites for diet purposes. And I was like, <laughs> I moonwalked out of that situation. Yeah, that's that not the crowd. So I wanna ask you, um, have you ever heard of people wanting to like use parasites for their diet purposes? Have you ever? You mean has, to actually eat? Yeah, and like, has any like, uh, has any like celebrity called you to like ask you about that? I'm setting you up, Scott. Well, yeah. So, um, yeah, you see, yeah. Basically, okay. some people uh, think that you could use parasites as um, diet aids, so you can lose weight. But um, it really doesn't work like that because even if you have tapeworms, tapeworms only use two ATPs out of every 38 that are available from a from a glucose molecule. And ATP is like the energy that we get from food in layman's Right. Way. So if you have a right. glucose molecule and you break down one glucose molecule, um, you 38 ATPs out maximum using um, aerobic yeah. respiration and anaerobic. But if you only use anaerobic respiration, you only get two ATPs out. And so basically it's what, one sixth? You, you don't get as much energy out. So basically you're not really uh, losing much weight um, by having a parasite. So, you know, when the several different people called us and, um, and uh, Penn and Teller came here to the lab because they wanted to know whether parasites uh, were really bad for us and how prevalent they are in human populations in North America. So they were here in the lab and we, uh, they told jokes and uh, it's an R-rated version. So you have to, uh, if you're gonna look at it, you have to know that's gonna be, the case is called detoxing. You have to pay for it on Showtime. But, you, um, but, but your lab was featured on Penn and Teller's show and it's called yes. That's super cool. I'm gonna have to check that out. Right, and it was, it was called, it's called BS. Oh yeah, and, yeah, yeah. I right. remember that show, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah, so I won't say it, but that's what it was okay. called. And so they, um, they got me on their show and they, we went, we looked at the lab here, we did a necropsy and we talked about parasitism. So it was pretty good. Um, Tyra Banks also called and I, and I wasn't interested in, I didn't the, know who that was. The Tyra Banks. Called. 
called you. Well, I didn't know who that was. But anyway, so that I said, no, I don't want to deal with that. So I wasn't really interested in uh, diet diet and parasitism at that point. But, but, when, but she, when, when she called you, like, how did she? Well, her agent called. Oh, well. But yeah, so. He, her agent, he must be yeah. like the expert. Yeah, like how lucky are we tonight? We get to talk to two experts. Right. Experts. Yeah. So I didn't tell her we're cool though. It was really fun. I like those guys. So I just know that the that parasite, what they are using, that um, it can be if it's uh, not the right one. Oh yeah. It's a very similar one. It can be deadly. It can cause uh, <laughs> brain cysts and other cysts. So right. Um, so it's a very risky idea. That's what I would say. That um, it's a very yeah. risky idea. Yeah, you don't want to. Uh, in fact, let me go get that poster. You know, I'm going to stick to pickboxing and running and like trying to eat a salad every once in a while. I'll probably just, yeah. just stick to that. Is, uh, Scott, oh yeah, I know where it is. So while it, he's kind of walking here, we'll, uh, we're going to ask you kind of a wrap up question. Uh, we always like to ask our, our experts, you know, what's their favorite bird or what's their favorite bee? And I probably hard. Yeah. So I guess like, what's your favorite parasite or do you have one because it's so interesting or the life cycle is cool what's the uh, boar what's your your favorite parasite in the world oh uh, that's a that's a tough one i think it's uh, both as a researcher there might be something that we would call that the favorite one and scott mentioned the echinococcus mm -hmm. one is because it's it's um it's a big problem so it's uh, what we call emerging uh infectious disease it's a very fascinating story. Well, for researchers yeah. and for people who are getting it, they are not that happy about it. But uh, in Europe, what happened that um, in the 90s, when I was still back there, they, were, uh, they decided to uh, use uh, bait uh, vaccines for foxes. Right, so putting anti-rabies. Anti-rabies, because they thought rabies is a deadly disease. So we want to... Um, to uh, vaccinate the foxes and, and people will not get uh, rabies. And uh, what happened that the fox population exploded and uh, now the fox population is the host for echinococcus. So everybody's getting high data disease. Exactly. So it's another disease which is almost as deadly or, or bad as the rabies. Yeah. So uh, it's an, what they are calling emerging uh, infectious disease in Europe. So I'll get my favorite parasite. Stay there. Oh, great. So, um, um, so for research purposes, and Scott mentioned that uh, in Mongolia found this uh, disease and uh, it's, it's an ongoing thing there. And uh, there are other uh, interesting, for scientific um, reasons, other in interesting aspects of this. Uh, Here's this mine. Thing. Oh my this, gosh, it's huge. <laughs> this is my favorite parasite. So normally we have pet dogs and he has a pet, whatever this is. Right, this is, a, this is Echinococcus multilocularis. This actually in reality is only three millimeters long, but we made a huge one for the museum. So this is it. Not to scale. Not to scale, but isn't that cool? That's super cool. Wow. Yeah, it's like, can you imagine that yeah, stuck, stuck in your gut? It has these hooks. <laughs> and uh, so this I'm is the the glass. Thank you. This is the glass alum. These are the suckers. The suckers hook on inside the intestine. Perfect. Suck in. Yeah. So anyway, that's us. So please come and visit. Yeah, that's awesome. And I was going to ask my last question. It's, it's kind of a brief one is if people want to like ever, like, this is the, this is like, as you mentioned, one of the largest collection of parasites in the Western hemisphere, right? Like, isn't it yeah, second this is, to only the Smithsonian? Is, it's the second largest collection in the Western hemisphere. The Smithsonian that's is the cool biggest. The British Museum is second. So how, how might people visit or, or do you ever have open houses or if, if people are really excited and interested, especially after this awesome nature nerd night, right? Um, yeah, how would this they, is like, so see cool. This? Yeah, how would they see? Um, they can, people can make an appointment to get a tour if they want. They can send an email and if we have time, we'll do that. But we usually have uh, an open house up here about once every two years. Yeah. So I just watch, watch in the newspaper, watch in your, uh, watch in the, uh, on your outlets, newspaper outlets online, or look at uh, the state museum. 
or look at our, our Facebook pages. I always put in Facebook posts mm -hmm. um, whenever okay. we have stuff we'll like that. We'll share those links um, in our follow-up email. Yeah, and I linked our, our Facebook page with yours, so we're, we're linked to so anybody who's interested to see what we're doing. Cool. So Scott, if really quick, if um, someone is interested, um, are you okay if we give out your email in our Nature Nerd Night kind of wrap-up evaluation just to, our participants. just to our participants and Absolutely. they can contact you? Okay. But, Yes, the thing is though, we just don't work on it, so. we just don't work on human parasites because we that's that's the main question is get we get maybe mm -hmm. two phone calls a week about you know I have I'm this sure. stuff coming out of my arm. We just we're not MDs, so we can't really do that. So that makes, we, we, yeah. we can talk about evolution, phylogenetics, ecology, and that kind of stuff, but we're yeah. we're not uh, able to diagnose. Gotcha. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, we're going to wrap up. Let's see, what do we have? Monica? We just have one more thing here. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I do want to just share really quickly again, in case you kind of missed it uh, when we started here. Um, we do have another Nature Nerd Night coming up. Um, it will be July 20th. It's going to be a Tuesday again, same time, 7 to 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. It will be virtual. It will have a separate registration, which we will email yeah. you next. Um, we're also going to be talking with another person at UNL. Yeah. Um, he's a highly bio paleontologist, yeah, right? Shane Tucker. Shane Tucker mm -hmm. is going to be joining us, Life in the Past Lane. Mm -hmm. um, so talking all about Nebraska's prehistoric creatures. So and now I'm going to be thinking, what parasites? What, that have? might have to be something we yeah. ask. Let me see if you know. Exactly. He's right downstairs. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Maybe pop in yeah. and say hi. <laughs> so we have a bunch of Nature Nerd Night stuff coming up. We kind of asked about these, about these questions. But like I said, we will be sending a kind of a wrap up follow up email. We'll have an evaluation in there for all of you. Um, we'll have some more resources that Scott and Gabor mentioned. So um, we'll definitely take care of all of you. But thank you so much for nerding out with us tonight. That Again, was thank you, Gabor, and thank you, uh, Scott. We really appreciate it. This is awesome. Thank and you. I it have, was, I have like it seemed like only five minutes, and here we are a whole hour. That's amazing. Yeah, um, I might cool. be emailing you a personal list of 50 more questions that I have, but I don't know. Maybe I'll pick Ethan's <laughs> brain too. We'll see. Yeah, it's a lot. Thank you. Awesome. Thank yeah. you all so much. Thanks, have everyone. And keep being curious and keep nerding out. Okay. It's, it's a cool. Yeah. Do it. All right. Bye, everybody. Good seeing everyone. Bye. Bye.